Now it's where a Baptist church ought to sound. I mean, you folks, you folks supposed to know where you're going. All these Pentecostals know whether they're going to make it or not, and what they're talking about. We get them, we get them down home, you know, we have Pentecostals come to our service for some time, and they sit there and the racket scares them so bad they just turn white in the face. <laughs> you know. They can't figure out, they can't figure out what's going on. <laughs> All right, now if you have a Bible mind, let's turn to the Gospel according to Luke, and make it Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. Luke 16, beginning at verse 19. Now if you read the Bible at all, you're familiar with the story. This is one of those outstanding stories in the Word of God. Certain chapters in the Word of God are outstanding, and they... You remember them the longer than you do the rest. Uh, I believe all the Bible is the Word of God from cover to cover. Amen. There are certain parts in it that have uh, more to them than other parts. And Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19, is a, is a story the Lord Jesus Christ tells there. Uh, this story is about hell. Uh, Jesus Christ preached on hell eight times in three years. That's uh, better than two times a year. So some of you folks have uh, been hanging around churches where the pastor doesn't preach about hell at least two times a year. You're not in a very uh, Christian type situation. You get talking about hell and people say, oh, I just I believe in the sweet spirit of Christ. Well, the term hellfire comes out of the Sermon on the Mount. First time the word hellfire occurs in the Sermon on the Mount, and these liberals who go around preaching the Sermon on the Mount, they're awful quiet about hell for some reason. They go through there and just take out what they like and throw out what they don't like. And Jesus Christ tells this story. Now Jesus Christ tells this story beginning at verse 19. The story runs like this. There was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen who fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus laid at the gate of the rich man's house desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now this story tells about a rich man and a poor man. And doesn't say whether uh, you know, the rich man was a good man or the poor man was a poor a poor man was a good man or a bad man. You say, well, I know in this story that the rich man must have been a bad man because the rich man winds up in hell, and the poor man must have been a good man because he winds up in heaven. Yeah, but you see, that's why the Lord didn't tell you that because that isn't true. Sometimes good people wind up in hell, and sometimes bad people wind up in heaven. You take a Pharisee there one time and stood and prayed with himself. And said, I thank God I'm not as other man or even as this publican. I'm not unjust. I'm an, not an adulterer, implying the publican was. And I fast uh, twice a week and tithe and give alms of all that I possess, which is more than some of you do. And uh, you take that kind of thing. That fellow, uh, Christ said about that fellow, he said he wasn't just by it. That was a good man who was lost and the publican was saved. So you can't always tell for that. So for that reason, when he tells this story, he just leaves out the moral part. And he just says there was a rich man and a poor man. That's all he says. Now, you take uh, that business of uh, money. That's something else. Uh, we've got a, on all our coins, we have a little sign that says, In God we trust. And there isn't anybody overseas that you'll fool about that. They know what Americans trust. Americans trust money. They know that. You don't fool those people in Europe, Africa, Asia. they got better sense than that. They know what you worship. They worship without a bill. Some folks, they squeeze the dollar bill so hard to get George Washington a permanent. <laughs> I saw something one time real good, which I wish I'd kept. It was some imitation money some guy made up, one of these mad magazine type of things, you know. I buy mad magazine, you know, I buy that. I, I take two magazines, the National Rifleman and Mad Magazine. I tell this to And uh, I only belong to two things. I belong to the church and I belong to the National Rifle Association. I'm a life member of the National Rifle Association. I believe in uh, God, guts, and gun. Amen. And I believe that's how you got this country. If you keep this country, if you're missing any one of those elements, you lose this country. Uh, folks say, well, why? I never heard such a military pride. Well, you just don't look too well. You ever see that picture of the pilgrims going to church in Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah. You know what they got? <laughs> they got guns. <laughs> that's the way to go to church. A Bible one arm, a 38 in the other. Yeah. <laughs> And you take, so I, I buy those kind of things, and you take, a, I saw a picture of a dollar bill one time, and it looks like a real dollar bill, except George is like this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the condition of the dollar bill in America today. 
But you take money, uh, most folks uh, want more money than what they have. Uh, if you got a raise five dollars an hour, you wouldn't weep tears over it. Uh, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now the new Bible don't say that. If you have a new King James Bible, it doesn't say the love of money is the root of all evil. Because whoever makes out those new Bibles is hung up on money. When they hit that verse, they change that verse. There's only one Bible in the American continent that says the love of money is the rule of all evil. The King James Bible. That's what don't say it. You don't believe it? Check it. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. Now the Bible says the love of money is the rule of all evil. Uh, somebody says, well, I thought the source was the devil. That's talking about the origin. Paul's talking about the root in the world system. Present tense. He didn't say the root was. He said the root is. The root of all the trouble in San Diego is love and a buck. That's right. Drug traffic, buck. Rock music, buck. Pornographic stuff, buck. Cat houses, buck. Prostitution, buck. Trying to get the money by the drugs, buck. It's a buck. It's a buck. Cover from your neighbors, government affairs, dollar bill, dollar bill, dollar bill. The love of money is the root of all evil. Now you understand he didn't say it was money that was the root of all evil. They misquote that thing sometimes, you know, and say, well, money is the root of all evil. It, it, it doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, you know, it isn't having money that damns you. It's loving it that damns you. And just because you're rich, I don't mean you're damned. And just because you're poor, I don't mean you're blessed either. You know, some folks get an idea because they're dirt poor, they have special favor with God nobody else has. That isn't true. There are some poor people who love money just as much as rich people do. Except they're worse off because they don't have it. <laughs> and you take that business, the love of money is unbelievable. Some people go after that, they make it the last goal. If you're from up north, you're a Yankee, you're bad on that. You're bad on that. Most northerners, they don't know learn how to live, they don't know how to make a living. But they're right up there in New York. I don't, don't tell me, I'll tell you. I preach all the Rochester and Green Bay and Flint, Michigan, Lance, Michigan, and Pittsburgh, and Al Clifford, and I, oh, I know what's going on up there. Those folks up there right now are striking. Cause, they're, cause they're only getting ten dollars an hour. <laughs> Gee, what a tough break. <laughs> if you can't live off ten dollars an hour, blow your brains out. <laughs> if you don't know how to be happy in ten dollars an hour, there's something wrong with you. I mean, really. You say, well, the stuff real high, yeah, but if you know how to enjoy life, you can enjoy life in that kind of money. Don't, don't kid me. And all that stuff. Some folks, they, they just get all they can and can all they get and sit on the lid and wait for the undertaker to come. There's old northern up there in Illinois and Indiana, they just work their fingers to bowl all their life and they come down to Sarasota and Fort Myers and St. Petersburg and kick the bucket. And some of them kick the bucket before they ever get there. And some of them kick the bucket a week after they get there. One of the most pitiful things you ever see in your life, you go to St. Petersburg and go to the K-pop tree. That big high class, I call it a high class dump. I realize I'm kind of crude. It's supposed to be an elite restaurant. I call it a high class dump. <laughs> and you go there and see those old Yankees sitting around there all wrinkled up. And those old women look like a 30 year Navy man. Sitting around there and they're all painted up like a possum hunter in pokeberry time. Got a cigarette man of a pool, just waiting for the devil to kick him off into hell. <laughs> pitiful, pitiful. They spend all the life trying to keep up in Cadillacs and jewel all over, look like a Christmas tree. For what? Man, we got, we, we got, we got color folks in our town to make $50 a week that live better than that. I mean, they do. They do. The love of money is the root of all evil. It'll get you. It'll get you. The best things in life money can't buy. You'll say, I've got all my life, but I'm not convinced. But maybe I can convince you for tonight, folks. You know, a fellow says the only thing money can't buy is poverty. <laughs> One of those fellows says, no, it's not the love of money at the root of all evil, it's the lack of money that's through. They got all kind of little things they say, you know, about the, trying to get the way around the thing. One time they said about a certain rich fellow, said, how much did he leave? And a Christian said he left it all. <laughs> you know how much you leave? You leave the whole thing. No, you don't be stupid. Back your brain drops, try to make a lot of money. What are you going to do when you get it? You should give it to your kids. How do you know it won't damn them? If your kids are worth anything, they'll make their way without it. And if they're not worth anything, it'll be worse for them to have it. Yeah. You get a pair around 70, 80, and be lying around the hospital, and all your kids around taking care of you, and each one of them trying to see if you can take care of the best care to get the most money. <laughs> You're a fool to make money your goal. You know one of the hardest charges that God ever gave a young preacher, he gave Timothy. You know the charge Paul gave Timothy? Paul told Timothy, he said, charge them that are rich in this world, that be not high-minded and trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. 
You know that's a hard, uh, hard uh, charge to give to a young preacher? Money being what it is these days, and you have to get money to get land, and have to money to buy a building, and have to have money to fix buses, and have to do money to get track to do the Lord's work. You need money all the time. I don't know of any fundamentalist in America who's got more money than he can handle. But you're to charge those rich folks. Don't be high-minded. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And you, you can throw the charge them out. You've got to charge them out. There's a charge. The best thing in life money can't buy. And yet, if this rich fellow lived in San Diego, most Baptist churches would be trying to make a deacon out of him, you know, and, and the Presbyterian churches trying to make an elder out of him, you know, and the Presbyterian would try to make a vestry out of him. And, and so, old man so and so down there got enough money, he could fence the whole place with gold fence posts and all that kind of thing. You know how to talk. Best things in life money can't buy. You say, well, I'd like to hear that prove. I'll prove it to you. I'll tell you some things about, I'll tell you some things about tonight that the best, some, be, some good things in life money can't buy. I don't care how rich you are, you can't buy them. You take, uh, you take, what's his name, uh, Rudyard Kipling, the British poet laureate. Uh, when he got well up in years, Mark got tired of asking him to come to Oxford or Cambridge, I think it was Oxford, to talk to the young man, lecture them. And he lectured them. He was rather impressed, impressed rather negatively by their fine clothes and their fine manners. And when he got through with his speech, he said something very significant. He said, uh, I notice most of you young men are very well healed. And evidently your fathers have a lot of money and you come from wealthy backgrounds. And he said, someday, when you get out in the world after you graduate here, and someday when you come down the line, you're going to meet a man somewhere to whom those things mean nothing. And he said, when you do, you realize how poor you are. Now, the best things in life money can't buy. You say, like what? Well, how about, uh, how about the love of a good woman? I mean, a good woman. I don't mean a dog. I don't mean a tranky buy for Coke, Cola, and a hamburger. I'm not talking about that. Talking about a good woman. Where do you buy that? Let me ask you this. Can you buy forgiveness of sins with money? Can you buy heaven with money? The best things in life money can't buy. Can you buy your own children with money? No. God will give you your own children. You won't have any children. We have couples come to our church. Uh, our church is a baby factory, man. We've got 35 kids in the nursery under five years old. 35 of them, man. And 50 of them between four and ten. I mean, we have a baby shower around there. It's a thunderstorm, man. It's a hurricane. <laughs> and every now and then we have them at, every now and then we have some of that school, some young couple, you know, where they've been married four or five years, no children. It's hard in a woman to come to our church and have no children hard on her boy. I mean, there's, there's some baby shower every other week. And I tell them if they can't have any children, they'll adopt children. I always tell them that. I always tell them that. I believe in that. I believe if you don't have any children, you'll adopt children. I don't care how old you are, how poor you are. I say, I wouldn't even worry about it. I'd adopt children. You say, well, I'd find them what life's all about. I believe that 80% of life is kids and dogs. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. And I believe if you haven't got kids and dogs to learn about life, you just don't know anything about. <laughs> now you take uh, you take children, uh, you take children. They're a blessing to have children. You say they're a pain in the neck. Yeah, I know about that too. I know about that too. You say, well, you ever get mad at your children? Yeah, I've been mad enough. I'm sometimes to shoot them. <laughs> they wear on your tear and get in your nerve, but but they're worth it. You say they go up and they step in your apron strings, you know, and then step in your heart strings. I know that's true. And sometimes they're a big disappointment to you and a responsibility and a burden to you, but they're worth it. They're worth it. You can't buy your own baby. God Almighty gives you your own baby, you won't have your own baby. The best things in life money can't buy. Where can you buy a healthy constitution? Where do you buy good health? I'm not talking about getting well after you get sick. I'm not talking about affording a doctor. I'm not talking about that. Where do you buy a naturally healthy constitution that can stand the ravages of time year in and year out, year in and year out without falling apart? Where do you buy one of them things at? You know, some of you could find a way to sell them things. You have people line up around this world 50 deep, 20,000 miles around the equator trying to get one of them bodies. But you can't buy them. You've got one and you don't. I say the best things in life money can't buy. And I'll convince you for him, Drew. Years ago in this country, was a rich man. We've had rich man off and on, but I guess one of the richest was Cornelius Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt wasn't a pauper like uh, John Paul Getty and old Charles Hughes. They were down there, you know, they were down there with the poor folk. <laughs> when Cornelius Vanderbilt died, he left behind $75 million. 
I don't mean stocks holding bonds. I mean 75 million smackers, Iron Man, cash boy. I mean 75 million to uh, most of the family and 25, uh, 50 million most of the family and 25 million to his oldest boy in cash. I probably could have hired, he could have hired Howard Hughes, Paris fingernails. <laughs> and out of ball, when you ever see his home up there in Carolina? You ever seen that place? Well, how many bed, bedrooms, bathrooms? 25 bedrooms, you know, 17 bathrooms, all that stuff. You ever something about how stupid that is? What do you get up and move each bed at night, go down, you know, sleep in 15 bedrooms? You want to sleep one bedroom at a time? <laughs> you can't just walk through there looking at the bed, you know? People are crazy. And you take, he sat down there one time at a table and ordered his old salad with no vinegar and oil and his melba toast, you know, he had ulcers, bleeding ulcers so bad he couldn't hardly stand it. And some college kid came in and sat down next to him and ordered one of those topsy flopsy floopsy mootsy something like that, big old jumbo ice cream, banana split junk, all of that thing. And sat there eating that thing and you know what he said? He turned to his meal secretary and he said, you know something? He said, I'd give half what I'm worth if I'd eat a meal like that. What do you buy a good stomach? They're not for sale. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm blessed with a good stomach. God bless me. I get sick in my stomach about once every six years, something like that. About once every six years. I eat all over this country. I go up north and eat New Yankees, English peas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that white bread, you know, you got white bread. Push it together, so the air goes out of it, you know. And that iced tea they sell up there, you can you clean out a shotgun barrel of that stuff, brother. If you ask for iced tea, bring you the thing that they got two lumps of ice in the top, you know. That's what think iced tea is, you know, that kind of stuff. And said so I'll eat that stuff and roll and lasagna, you know, and a spaghetti. Look. Now the less gonna be shocked I live just tonight. <laughs> Ain't all that food up there tastes like a bed sheet or sand or something. It tastes like, it tastes like you're chewing a pillowcase or something. It's peculiar. It, 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 it's starch. You go in there, lasagna, noodles, spaghetti, and bread. Pancakes, waffles, you know. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now I can eat it. Let me eat it. And don't make me sick. Don't make me sick. I come down to Louisiana and eat that crayfish biscuit and that Billy Gumbo and put on enough Tabasco sauce and that and light up a fire with more. I eat down the south and just make a bill of fire and put it out. <laughs> I can say I need jalapenos whole, take vinegar and drink it raw, drink the vinegar out of the glass, take that brine that pickle olives in and drink that, chew it on you, eat a piece of garlic and I won't even belch. <laughs> That's right. God been good to me, man. Give me a cast iron belly. <laughs> and I'm glad of it, too. You can't buy them. You can't buy them. Years ago up there and around Lake Michigan, Bob Jones Sr. had a meeting. He was just a young preacher then, his early 20s. And had a meeting up there at the home of a rich man. And I forget what he said the fellow's house cost, $4 million or something like that. Cost the house wasn't that much. House was about half a million. But it was on a million dollars worth of property and had a two million dollar yacht out there in the bay anchored up and all this and that. And he sat down at that fellow's house and uh, sat down at the table to eat. And the fellow and his wife had supper that night. It was just the two of them and Bob Jones. And Bob Jones sat across the table and the man sat at one end of the table. His wife sat at the other end of the table. And he said that table was so long he'd a Pony Express to get a message from one end to the other. <laughs> And he said he sat down at that table after a while, he noticed a high chair across the table from him while he was reading. And he said to the man, he said, uh, pardon me, he said, uh, do you have a child? And when he said that, the man got kind of nervous and the woman dropped her head and looked down at her plate. And the man said, well, yes, he said, uh, about four or five years ago, God gave us a little boy. And he said he lived for two years and then the Lord took him. And he said, we tried to move that high chair away from the table, but we just don't seem to be able to move it, so we just let it sit there. I thought I had, he had a million dollar worth of junk in his house. He had carving and tapestries from Egypt and original urns and vases from Greece and hand paintings originals by Tinoretto that cost him a half million dollars in that house. Now, that that fellow happened to be a saved fellow. Can you imagine what happened if that fellow been unsaved? Can't you see that fellow walking through that museum he had for a home and stop in front of those statues and saying, speak to me, help me. God just take a little boy. You cost me so much. Comfort me. Say something to me. 
You can't say nothing, do you? The money can't do it. It's good for nothing. But come a time in your life, you want to get in a place where unless the Holy Spirit comforts you and gets you through, you gonna make the biggest mess you ever saw in your life. And money ain't gonna have nothing to do with it. Listen, some of the biggest drunken slobs in this town are doctors and lawyers and bankers that make two hundred thousand dollars a year. Don't kid me. Don't kid me. I've been around too long. They're drinking themselves to death. You know why? No comforter. The best things in life money can't buy. Like I just said. There was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus, laid at the gate of the rich man's house, covered with sores, desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. More with the dog came and licked their sores. Or right, the rich man, the poor man. You said that fellow's a beggar? Yes, yeah, he's a beggar. You say, could there be such a thing as a Christian beggar? Don't you know in this story the poor man winds up saved, winds up in heaven? Yes. Well, if he winds up in heaven and he's a saved man, how could there be such a thing as a Christian beggar? Doesn't the Bible say, I have been young and I'm now old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or to see begging bread? Yeah, that's what it says. Doesn't the Bible say, my God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? That's what it says. You say, how in the walk of this fellow be saved, then and be begging? I'll tell you how that works. Sometime when a nation turns its back on God and turns its back on God and turns its back on God, the saved people suffer right along the unsaved people. Right. They were good people in Jerusalem. They suffered plenty when Nebuchadnezzar came in and tore that place down. And when Titus came in, sometime the righteous suffer right along the unrighteous. Solomon has something to say about that. And uh, I don't, I don't relish the day and look forward to the day when. I'll see you or my kids trying to get their food out of the garbage can, but it's happened in other countries. Right. Americans think they're immune. Americans are spoiled. They're spoiled. You're spoiled. You drove here in a car tonight, most of you didn't walk, you drove in a car. I've seen them come to meet in the back end of a tractor. I've seen them walk five miles in their bare feet in South Alabama. And over in Russia, why well, they'd have been glad if they could have walked five miles to get to a service. Americans are spoiled. They gripe. They complain. They bellyache. Some of you haven't thanked God for your breath today, and the people in the hospital are strangling to death. Some of you haven't thanked God for your feet today, and there are people who don't have any feet. Americans are spoiled. You say, I don't have much of a car. You may not have much of a car, but the thing got you here. I mean, I'll, I'll admit it might be a rolling pile of junk. Might have got here one piece at a time, but it got you here. <laughs> Over in Pensacola, they had a guy go across the toll bridge there, you know, and said, 25 cents, he came flying across there and rattled across there and some junk heap he kept together for about 15 years. And the guy at the toll bridge said, 25 cents, and he said, sold. <laughs> <laughs> but you got here. And you take, you take American to spoil. Oh, the Bible says all nations forget God to return to hell. Right to exalt the nation that sin is approached to any people. And someday God's going to settle accounts with America. Bob Jonas used to say God won't take from America what he'll take off other nations. And the reason why he won't is because America's had too many advantages and too many privileges other nations didn't have. And God won't take off this country what he'll take off other nations. If I got back home in a couple of weeks, I'd pick up a newspaper and read this whole seaboard of California from Frisco to San Diego dropped off in the water and cost about eight million people their lives. I might be sad about it when I remembered you. After having met you and your pastor, and some of the Brother Bateman's people up there, and Rasmussen people, I remember the Christians were here, but I wouldn't be surprised. I might feel sad about it, I wouldn't be shocked. Not me. The way they live out here, the only a few people can just go into perdition. There's a bunch of people still be that book and still pray. And any time you think you're a minority, just step outside that door and look. The Bible says, right to exalt the nation, but sinners are approached to any people. The trouble is all the nations keep thinking there's something different, something unique. That's the problem. The Bible says all the nations that forget God should be turned into hell. So it's not America. Yeah, America, America. Listen, I've, I've stood in a chow line, taken my mess kit, gone to a chow line, and scraped my mess kit out into a tin can. A little old kid stood there with a tin can and took that garbage and took it home for his mother and daddy to eat. I've been in Japan after World War II. You couldn't find her a dog or a cat in Tokyo anywhere. You know why you couldn't find them? Because they ate them. 
And I've been in there, I've gone, I've gone by those trusses at night, those electric cranes go over, and I've seen kids, 10, 11, 12 years old, 100 of them, pile up in a ball, sleeping together at night under those trestles. No mother, no father, no aunt, no uncle, no nothing. And the snow come down at night, cover them up. Get in the morning, shake the snow off them, go around and try to find something to eat. Got a friend that adopted a little Korean boy after that mess was over, a Christian couple of mine, they adopted a little Korean boy, and they wondered, do you know what he was doing during the daytime? He'd disappear for a while, and they wouldn't see him for a while, he'd be chewing or something, and they couldn't figure out what it was, and they finally was catching flies and eating them. The kid had learned when he was starving in Korea, go down the alleys and catch flies and eat the flies. American was spoiled. When I came back from World War II, I came back to the Frisco to the Golden Gate up yonder. When I came back to the Golden Gate up yonder and looked up there and saw the shoreline up there and those houses up there, those little old white houses, I knew what was up there. I knew what was up there. Cars in the garage, you know, and a deep breeze and the radio, you know, and that kind of thing. And I, I'll tell you, a feeling of bitterness came over me. If somebody caught me when I first got back from overseas, I'd have made a good car, a communist candidate. I really would have. I've been over there in the Philippines, and I've seen people live over there whose uh, house was a platform in a tree. I don't mean a thatched roof. There wasn't any roof on the thing. The thing was a platform in a tree. That's where they lived. And you come back to America and see that stuff, and you wonder. You wonder. Listen, any time this country gets thinking God bless it because it's democratic or capitalistic or right wing, you're headed for a crack up. I'm here to tell you, and I'm not worried about apologizing anybody now or later, and my mind is just as closed on it, and just as dogmatic and narrow minded and bigot as any bigoted bigot that ever lived. I'm here to tell you the only reason God has blessed this country is because this country so far has read that book and believed that book and tried to do something about it. Amen. And if it weren't for that book, this country would have been buried in hell a hundred years ago. Amen. Yes. It's that book. You take care of that book, God take care of you, let that book go to pot, you go to pot, and your whole nation with it. And this business, capitalistic, democratic, oh, cut it out, you're killing me, man. These capitalists just have many sins the communists do. They'll skin you out of a buck as quick as they will or quicker. You take a communist, that's all he is, just the capitalists don't have any money, that's all he is. <laughs> and that kind of business, all that mess. You know, one day Greece said, we're the greatest country in the face of the earth, nobody's like the Greeks. We have the orders, the Mosterys, and Euclid, and Pythagoras, the mathematicians. We've got the, the philosophers, Socrates, and Plato, and Aristotle, and Maximides, and Maximander, and we're the greatest, most intelligent, cultured people upon the face of the earth. And God set the Roman legions in there and wiped them out. And one day Rome said, all oh, rules lead to Rome. Rome is the eternal city. And you know what God did? God took those vandals, those Visigoths, and Huns, and vandals, and Ostrogoths and sent them down there and wiped out Rome and burned it to the ground. And one day those Goths, those Germanic tribes and Huns and Visigoths and Vandals said, Deutschland, Deutschland, you got us today, Germany, the man of the world. And before God got through with them, the women were selling themselves at chocolate bars in the streets. When the Russian came through, they'd drag it off by the hair on the tanks. No country ever got away with it. Babylon didn't get away with it, Persia didn't get away with it, Greece didn't get away with it, Rome didn't get away with it, Germany didn't get away with it. One day England said, mechanical rules the waves, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, brother, it just done set. It just done went down. There isn't any British Empire. England today is a fifth-rate world power. Japan, Russia, West, Germany, United States, and probably Israel are ahead of England. And this place today is just a bunch of, a bunch of drunken, Rich worshippers, beetles, dopehead, slapping each other with pubs downtown, nothing left that country. While some of you people have eat, eaten better in the last week than some of the rich people over there have eaten in the last two months. You don't believe it? Why don't you go and check me out? Bought the education. You know what England did about 1904? It got rid of its King James Bible. In 1904, the British Foreign Missionary Society said, no more text was receptus in the mission field. The British Foreign Missionary Society said, let's take that German text from Nestles and let's use that as the basis of a missionary translation. God said, you do, I'll shut up your missionary door, you got it. And China went and India went and all the rest of it went. The sun never set the British Empire. Well, it's set. And I'm here to tell you if this country doesn't get right, God's going to take this country, God's going to clean house. God, no respect of nations.
This comes to W. Littovich, nude women, and this dirty billboard, and this pornographic literature, and this adult movies, and quit uh, placking all these lesbians and appeal all these queers for votes, the love of money through the law evil. See? God's going to take his place, bomb her out. Bomb her out. Not been any change. Americans are ungrateful, they're unthankful, they're unholy. I get, I get sick when I think about it. I still, I still get a thrill when I hear the Star Spangled Banner, but I must admit it's not a thrill of bravery and glory, it's a tearful, tragic thing to hear. I hear almost weep, and not because it stirs me up. When I think about those words, or does that Star Spangled Banner still weave, or the land of the free and the home of the brave, I don't know if it'll laugh or cry. The home of the brave, you can't even sell your house to people you want to sell it to. You can't even advertise the paper what kind of help you want for your kids for discriminating against somebody. The land of the free, your foot. I, do, I protest all I can. I notice your, your brother, your pastor, he's a good man. He goes to the restaurant and, they say, and it says, please wait to be seated. He waits. I never do. I never do. I go to the restaurant, I go right in and sit down. They said, the table hasn't been cleared yet. Just, just shut up, I'm paying the bill. I'm paying the bill. I get sick and tired of going to these places have the waitresses put you on charge to give you an exam to see if you'll meet their demands. I'm getting the shaft. I'm paying the bill. They are there to wait on me. Amen, amen, amen. Now, some of you folks don't like that, see? You know what it is? You're shot already, man. You're already gone. You succumb to the system. Contest, contest, contest. You want your, you want your coffee? Medium, small, or large. You want a thin, black, or white. Do you want the big size, the medium size, the regular size? Do you want it now? Do you want it later? I go by the cash register. You want this change in quarters and inches? You want to pay it by check or by visa card? You want this thing? You want three pennies or five pennies? Would you rather have two nickels? I mean, give them a taste of their own medicine. <laughs> you want your coffee black? No, I want purple. <laughs> I mean, put the stuff on the table. If you want to eat it, eat it. If you don't, leave it there. Now, this thing you got to do with a contrast between you and the waitress. Yeah. You think I'm kidding you? Next time you go on one place, see who has the last word. Yeah. Right before she leaves, she'll think of something. Cornbread or hush puppets. <laughs> she'll think of something. I went to one of those places, and I said, I want that uh, big hamburger with the cheese on it. And they said, the, 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 uh, uh, some name, I can't remember the name right now, but some crazy name, you know, like, like the Uncle Wiggly special, you know. I said, no, the big one with the cheese. Oh, that's the Uncle Wiggly. I said, I don't want Uncle Wiggly. <laughs> You want the big one or the two one? <laughs> I mean, I get tired of that stuff. I mean, I, 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 went through, I went through the other day. I've had this happen twice. I go through and beep the machine. Beep, you know, security beep. I don't like machines that talk. I wouldn't have a car that beeps at me. You know, when you get in, beep, your belt is not, beep, your lights are on, beep, you forgot your key, beep, your door is locked, beep. I tell them, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Beep, shut up. I don't want to hear nothing about it. I can't stand a, a machine that talks back at you. And you go through there and that machine goes, beep, you know, and the lady says, what is it? I said, nothing empty your pockets, nothing in my pockets, lady. Well, it's buzzed, and I say it's my belt buckle. She says, well, take off your belt. I said, you want my pants with it? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, the very idea of a grown woman you don't even know in public telling you to take off your belt. Why, well, you floozy? Not for you. Amen, amen, amen. And folks say, oh, Rock, when you're just me. No, I've had time to think this thing over. Yeah. And little by little day, and look on your your privileges, your liberties, and they take one from you at a time, and the first thing you know, you haven't gotten there left. Protest, brother, protest. Be uncooperative. <laughs> I go in there, please wait to be seated, you know, that kind of thing. I go in and sit down, she says, I'm sorry you can't sit there. I say, okay, good day, and get up and walk out. I don't care if she bought the water and put it down on the table. It makes no difference to me. I'm paying for the seat. I'll take the seat I jolly well please. 
I want one of those places that you can't sit there. You have to sit over here. I said, lady, I've got to read about 20,000 words a day, and my eyes aren't too good at my age, and I'm not about to go blind just to line up with how you've got this restaurant lined up. And she said, well, we're not serving that table today. I said, okay, you're not serving me. Good day. Got up and walked out. I'm driving a gas station. I'm pulling a gas station in the ring when that thing says, you know, 90 cents a gallon, and then when you get up there, you find it's 90 cents for cigarettes, you know. Now, they put the sign up there so you make you think it's the gas when it's diesel or kerosene or something. I'll wait till the guy comes out and then gun it off and leave him standing there in the rain. <laughs> Don't lie to me about the price. Deal straight with me or get wet. <laughs> Damn you know, straight to be a Christian, isn't it? And, I, and I'll say, I'm an American. I'm an American. Real sure enough American. I know communist. I know pinko. I'm for this country, but I've got any illusions about this country. You're not going to stand up and say, God bless America and live like this country's living. God ain't going to bless America. Amen. You couldn't ask God to bless this country the way it's going, doing what it's doing. You better ask God to have mercy upon America and save some of these rascals, which you better do. American hand grateful and holy. I told people in this country 20 years ago, you're going to be living to see the crime, you're paying $2 for a hamburger. And folks laughed at me. They don't laugh anymore. I judge a nation's income and its economy by chocolate. Now, I know mean, that's not the right way to do it. I got my own way of doing things, and I'm probably wrong on a lot of these things. But if I got my own way of doing things, and my way to judge an economy is by chocolate. You know why I do that? I've got a reason for doing that. Doesn't sound like much, but I got my reason. You know what I deserve? I deserve when you get in combat and get down to no food, they give you K-ration. K-ration is a chocolate bar. That's the basic unit. The basic unit of exchange in any country is chocolate and cigarettes. That's the basic unit. You take a fellow when he dies, gets right on his last pin in the hospital and passing away, you know what they give him? They give him dextrose. They put sugar in him. Got them all cooked up there putting sugar in him. That's the basic unit. When I was aboard, I had a Hershey bar about that big. It was a nickel. Well, if I think you're selling for your store, they're selling for 98 cents. You know, they're selling for the airport, $2.50. You know what that thing is? That's 500% inflation. You know what that means? It means if you kept up with inflation, the minimum wage right now should be $8 an hour. You know how much you should be getting off for your kids? He's going to exempt to your kids. You should be getting $5,000 a piece, each one of your kids, exemption. Tax exemption. You're not getting it. Country going down the two. <laughs> American Hunt, grateful that I'm thankful. I get griping like that at some time, but my complaint is with a bunch of rascals, it's not with God. God's been good to me. And God's been good to me even in this nation. And this nation still has enough left in it where I'd stay in it. Folks say, if you don't love it, leave it. No, not even. That ain't it. I got here first, you leave. <laughs> I mean, the kind of people that came over to this country, the start of this country, were people like me. They people even guns and Bibles and standing for something and not backing off and keeping your liberties. Believe it. But you ought to be thankful. Are you thankful? I mean, I thank God the hamburgers aren't ten dollars a hamburger so far. <laughs> one time an evangelist got he got saved, got preaching the gospel, and one day he went downtown after he'd been saved a couple of years. He walked along downtown and he walked along downtown. You see, I'm going up here, just an average, uh, you know, middle class type of home, you know. Why, there's place in the world where that's a rich man's home. That's a, that's a rich man's home. And this man that's walking down the street, and he went by a pool hall and saw a bunch of fellas shooting pool in there and shooting in and rocking out, and he said, thank God to save me from that. He went a little bit further, and he saw a fellow throw a cigar butt in the street, and he said, thank God to save me from that. He went a little further and went by a theater and saw a bunch of people standing in line in the theater, and he said, thank God to save me from that. And they went by, and he went by a mirror and a weighing machine. He looked in that mirror for a while, and he said, Yeah, and thank God for saving me from you, too. Amen. If you can't thank God for nothing, you can thank God for saving you from yourself. I mean, if God hadn't saved me from old Pete Ruffman, let me ask you something. What do you think I'd be doing tonight, on Saturday night, with this talent, if I wasn't saved? You think I'd be here entertaining a bunch of Christians? You better thank God he saved you from yourself as well as hell. Yeah. We had up in Alabama years ago an old fellow named Uncle Bud Robinson. He's a Nazarene preacher. Now, I don't agree with his theology, but he's a good fellow and loved the Lord and believed the book, did a lot of good. And you take Bud Robinson, Bud Robinson had never seen a building any higher than about ten stories. 
And he went to New York one time. And when he got to New York and got New York, he saw the, went down there, you know, and saw the Times Square and saw the Chrysler Building and saw the Empire State Building just been built in those days. And old Bud went around there and looked up in the air, 50, 60 story, hung his uh, went back to his hotel room and his tonker was sunburnt from looking up in the air. <laughs> And he got back to the hotel room and he knelt down on his knees that night before he went to bed and prayed. And when he got down on his knees to pray, he said, Dear Lord, he said, I just want to thank you that I didn't see nothing today that I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you know, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great progress there. Amen. Think how wonderful it would be to get through one whole day and not see one thing that you wanted. Amen. That's a great blessing, brother. Amen. That's a great blessing. All right, there was a certain poor man, a beggar named Lazarus, laid at the gate of the rich man's house, covered with sores, designed to be fed with a crumb that fell from the rich man's table. More with the dog came and licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died, and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Fellow died. I don't know how he died. Probably some cold winter night. Nights are cold over in Palestine in the winter. He might have been lying down there behind a hedge and getting cold and knew he was freezing to death and knew he wasn't going to make it. Heard some dogs coming along the hedge, you know, panting, thought they were going to get him, prayed they wouldn't get him. The Lord sent the dog on some other way. He lay there and got colder and colder and colder, and then he got warmer and warmer. Then he got just warm as toast. Then went sound asleep. Woke up about 12 o'clock at night, maybe a little bit later. When he woke up, he looked up over his head there, and all the stars were up there, studded in the vault of heaven like diamonds, and the oriental midnight, and up there, between the crackling branches of a frozen tree. He could see two beautiful angelic beings and they came by and stopped about 20 feet off the ground and said, get a bull, ma'am, we're going home. Yeah. And he said, I can't go home. I'm old. I got arthritis and lumbago and rheumatism and everything else. I can't, I can't get up. They said, give me spies easy. Just get up. <laughs> and he just stepped out and left that body stuck there to the ground and went on home. Bible said the angels died in Abraham's bosom. You say, where's Abraham's bosom? I don't worry about this kind of thing. I know one thing I know was where Abraham was. I know what Abraham was called. Abraham was called the friend of God. I know one thing about him. When he died, he went to be where the friends of God were. I know that. I don't have to worry about those kind of things because I know where I'm going. You know, Christ said to one of his disciples, you know the way. You know the way. And he, and he said, well, where I'm going, you can go. And you know what Paul said? Paul said, I know whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep the proper time committed him against that day. Paul didn't have any doubt about where he was going. Paul said, absent the body, present of the Lord. Paul said, to depart and be with Christ is far better. We know where we're going. If you don't know where you're going, you've got problems. Every saved man in that Bible knew where he was going when he died. Simon Peter said, I must surely put off this tabernacle that the Lord has showed me. Paul said, I know him, I believe, I'm persuaded, is able to keep God, God committed him against that day. John says, these things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. How is it that you don't know where you're going when you die, when every saved person that Bible knew? Amen. Your Catholic friends don't know. They don't know. They hope they're going to go to purgatory and instead of going to hell, but they don't know. Your Buddhist friends don't know. They don't know where they're going to make it. A Bible-believing Christian is the only person on this earth that knows where he's going for sure when he dies. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is what? What? Dream. A J.W. can't say that. Because the grave isn't the game. Don't you get mad with me? Just because you're stupid? Don't you get mad with me? Instead of getting mad at me, you go out and get it on the table like I have, and then you tell me what they believe. I know what they believe. They believe when you're dead, you're dead like a dog, and lie down in the grave unconscious. I know exactly what they believe. That is what Paul believed. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul said, I'm going to straight the tricks too, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is what? What? Again. Far better. See? Not just better. Far better. Every Christian is better off dead than alive. <laughs> Ain't that a thought? <laughs> a lady said to me one time, she said, brother up, and I think I'm losing my mind. I said, why is that? She said, well, my husband died, and I've been left alone now. I don't have any brothers or sisters. 
We never had any children. And he's gone now. She said, I'm nearly 70 years old. And she said, I'm just left with nothing but just God. I know I'm saved, but I just, somehow I think I'm losing my mind. I said, why that? She said, I just feel like committing suicide. I said, oh, fine, fine. You're perfectly normal. <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? I said, every Christian thought about that. Well, what, 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 what poet? I'm not going to say he was crazy. I'm not going to say that. But anybody got as much trouble as he got to wasn't trying to be careful. <laughs> I mean, did, did you ever read 2 Corinthians 11? Do you need to tell me a fellow lived like that was trying to be careful? I did one time in that book. He came out of uh, Berea someplace, a Thessalonian, one of those places. He came out of there, and they stoned him like the knock his brains out. And they left him for dead there in the room. And they gathered around him, and the Bible said he came through and got up. And you know what he did when he got up? He went back into the city where they would just been stolen. Did you read that thing? Not a strange thing to do. <laughs> Why, in Second Corinthians chapter 12, he said, I knew a man above, uh, above 14 years ago, whether in the body out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows such a one was caught up the third heaven and heard words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Not a boy got... Laid out there on the ground, his soul left there, went up to heaven, the Lord showed him all that stuff, probably showed him Stephen. Stephen was up there. Hi, Paul! That thing was over, Paul said, uh, okay, I'm sure I'm glad to be home. And the Lord said, you ain't home yet. Well, sure, this is my home right here, yeah, but you got to go back down. Oh. <laughs> Go back down, yeah, back down. Well, now, Lord, let's work out a deal here. How about, how about a vacation? Two years, two years up there, back down. Two weeks, two weeks, Lord, back down, I'll throw you out. Two hours, two miles, back down. The guy comes to, he's lying flat on his back in the ground with a camel. Did you ever smell a camel? <laughs> <laughs> Camel's over him like that and comes up. Every bone in his body aching, skin all torn to pieces, scabs all over him, smelling that stinking Near East dust on that road. What a change of pace. You know what he said? He said, I know how to get back up. I'm all right back in that car. Now, maybe, maybe you can't find that in that theology book, but I, I suspect that. I suspect that. Now, just come on, be reasonable, brother or sister. If God showed you the place tonight, what would you do if you had to come back down? <laughs> you could see it. Now, the Lord, he didn't let you see it, so he got you all shut up, so you know whether it's there or not. You just got to go by faith and blind, see? But if you could see it, and step in there and see that place, with no sorrow, no taxes, no tears, no pain, no death, no misunderstandings, no arguments, no crying, no bills, sinless, perfect, and knew you'd never sin again, and knew you could do what you wanted to do for eternity and never have to worry about it, and to think anything you wanted to think and do anything you wanted to do and never have to even check to see if it was right, I'll tell you, brother, take angelic violence to throw me out. I said when I got down here I'd feel called to preach in the middle of the freeway <laughs> now you know uh, some of you folks down here uh, I don't know what you've been exposed to I don't know what your preacher preaches but I can tell when I get in the church pretty well what he's been preaching but how folks respond and you had some pretty hard preaching. Your pastor's been real tough on you. Now, I don't even have to hear it. I can tell you how you act, see? You see, when you've been out as long as I have, you get to the church, you can get the temperature just in about 15 minutes. Because if the preacher's been soft and messing around, the people are all rested and relaxed and... <laughs> and the first time you stick them, they holler, see? But if they've been stomped on for two or three years, when you come up there and say something, they just laugh. <laughs> That's right. Now, I don't suppose, I don't suppose there are very many people here tonight that haven't in the real to. I suppose most of you folks haven't in the real place. I'd gather that by your response. 
But I've preached many a times about heaven. I had them sit there and look at you like a tree full of owls, man. They don't know what you're talking about. They don't know what you're talking about. I feel sorry for those kind of folks. I feel especially sorry for folks up my age. You know, you get up over 60, you have them better start getting real to you, man. You sure better have it's about time. You fellas my age and over, uh, you ever made a fool out of yourself yet, for Christ's sake? When are you going to do it? People get up my age, they get conservative, and they get uh, stiff, and they get formal. I, I wouldn't die and go to heaven without making a fool out of myself for Jesus Christ's sake at least a number of times. You say, wow, well, God knows I did enough uh, earlier and made a fool out of myself on our other bunch of occasions for nothing. And you get talking about heaven, they don't know what the thing is about. I feel sorry for you. You know what I've learned from life? I've learned anything. If I've learned anything from life, you know what I've learned? I've learned there's only one thing that's real, and that's God. The only thing real is what you can't see. Something right there, it'll fall apart. Something right there, it'll rot. You see those lights there? The bulbs will go bad. So the car out there, you got it, it'll fall apart. You see your wife? She'll get old, she'll fall to pieces on you. <laughs> your husband? Same way with you too, brother. Same way with you too. Your hair will come out, your chest will drop, your feet will fall, the whole thing you just collapse, man. It's, yeah, everything you see falls apart. Then they get built that part of what you don't see. Now you tell when I first got saved, I didn't know the answers, but I knew the problems. When I got saved, I didn't know any of the answers because I didn't know Christ. But I knew the problems. Let me tell you, when I was 27 years old, I live as fast, probably still do right now, much of the year, some of you do in 10. Talk about ahead of that time, man. Listen, listen, man. I had color fellas playing piano in my house at 2 o'clock jam sessions in 1938 in Topeka, Kansas, in the white section. Don't talk to me about progressive. <laughs> They were passing out those cigarettes for the blind rock in the band I was playing in 1939. We were sitting cross-legged in the Iraq Hotel in Transcendental Meditation in 1947. You're late. You're late. And you know what happens when you rush through life like that? You get like Presley. By the time you're 40, you're all burnt out. There's nothing to live for. That's what happens to you. Listen, when I was 27, when I was 27... I looked as old when I was 27 as a picture taken me when I was 50. As God is my witness, the Lord just done a lot for me. Just kept my face in that book. There's something that comes off that book and it renews you. It keeps you. When I, was, when I was 27, let me tell you, I was a ram and wreck from Georgia Tech, boy. And I, at, at 27 years old, I knew something. You know what I knew? I knew it wasn't down here. Some of you still think it is. It isn't. Now, I don't have to get me wrong. I'm no pessimist. I enjoy life much as anybody you ever saw. Probably for my age, I better get as much out of life as any man this, on this earth. Maybe more. I'm not dying like carnal, man. Carnal. I still play racquetball. I still play softball, hockey, ice hockey. I played goalie about two months ago up there in Michigan. <laughs> At home, I've got a 400-yard gill man. You know, downright carnal, worldly. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy life, man. But I got good sense. I know what's ahead. You know what's ahead? Hospital beds and graves. That's what's ahead. I started as a young man. I went through uh, Cowboy Coopers and Tex Ritter and Eddie Arnold and Hank Penny and... Hank Snow and Ray Cuff and all that bunch and came out and went out to Benny Goodman and Stan Kenton and Artie Shaw and Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey and went up at Andre Costellani and went out to Bach and Beethoven and Brahms and Schumann and Mendelssohn and Grimsey Korsakoff and Honda. When I got through, I was just as empty and dry as the bottom of a cracker barrel. And I began drawing pictures and began to copy Maggie and Jigs and copy uh, Popeye and Mickey Mouse and pretty soon I began to draw after Flash Gordon and Alex Raymond and studied the styles of the pointillists and the abstractionists and the surrealists and began to study Picasso and then I studied Rembrandt and then Rumor and then Tintoretto and the Van Gogh and Toulouse for Crack and went off through the French Impressionists and wound up with Michelangelo and the whole bunch of When I got all through my sermon was just dead and dry and barren as famished at the inside of a hollow bowl was nothing in it. And then I found Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I argued. 
got what I was looking for. <laughs> it works. Walking along life's road one day, I heard a voice so sweetly say, They're building a mansion in heaven for thee. Here's a beautiful, beautiful home. Home, sweet home. Home, sweet home. Where I'll never I see the light of that city so bright. Here's my home, sweet home. Life's very short, I soon must go to be with him who loved me so. I see in the distance the shining glow of my beautiful, beautiful home. Oh, sweet home. Oh, sweet home. Where I see the light. In that city so bright is my home, is my beautiful home. Gregor died and was found by the angels, Abraham was bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted his eyes being in torments, and seeth Abraham the fine Lord. And said, Send Lazarus and dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this F L A M E. Go he went to hell, he's burning. The fellow said he went to the grave. There's nothing burning in the grave. No play in the grave. That fellow was praying. No torment in the grave. That fellow was in torments. Nobody in the grave hollering for water. It's not the grave. Not the grave. Went to hell. H double L hell. Hell. Christ said he went to hell. What do you say? I get tired of these folks standing up, you know, and so I don't like a hell farm damnation preaching. Well, you want your thumb your nose at God Almighty, and you're not taking any skin off my nose. I didn't invent the doctrine. I didn't believe in it. I didn't, I didn't write the book. If it been left to me, I wouldn't have said the best that man could do to send him to hell. I wouldn't have thought that at all. I'm a man just like you are. I'd have said, do the best you can, you'll be all right. That's how any man would think. Any man thinks wrong. Amen. All this stuff. You know, one of my students up there, I got some students up there that are, they're rough, boy, I'll tell you that. Some of them make me look like a modernist, boy. I mean, I get, I get some wild characters, boy. We get a lot of good guys. We get a lot of dingbats, too. I mean, we get all, we get all kinds of stuff. You know, people, these past all the young people, they can't handle this, send them down the road. It gets the dredges of them, all the people that, you know, wash out ministerial, they send to me. We got this kind of a ministry, you know. And I get some good fellows. I get some wild ones. I've got guys that go in the Catholic church and turn the statues upside down. <laughs> I've never had to encourage you. <laughs> one one, one, one time, blew out all the candles, man. And they, they went the man and came in. I don't tell them to do things like that. They, they, they just think them up themselves, you know. I, you don't have to encourage a man. I about got in trouble one time. I said, well, if you put a rubber statue of Mary in your bumper and drag it through down, down, then I, I saw their face, so I said, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind. I mean, I, I, I can see what was going to happen. They're going to try it, you know. And one of those fellows, he was talking to the J.W., and the J.W. was saying, no, hell and hell is the grave, and hell is the grave, and the only hell is the grave, and all this stuff. And after he kept going out stuff about 15 minutes, this kid, you know, he wasn't telling the truth, but he sure reached him. <laughs> he said, boy, I sure wish I'd known that about hell being the grave. And this J.W. said, why is that? And he said, because if I'd known that, he said, my sister died last week, and if I'd known that, we wouldn't have buried it. We were hung on a tree. <laughs> oh, boy, what I, I'll tell you, man. I, that's a thing to say, man. That's a thing to say. <laughs> I mean, if the grave is hell, if... If the grave is hell, they're all going to hell. Do you, you think less of the in hell right now? Why, he's in the grave. The reality is saying hell the grave. 
When Paul and Peter and James and John died, they all went to hell. What nonsense. They had the body and person of the Lord. The first fellow died, he was buried, he went to hell. Now Christ said he went to hell. I don't care what the rest of them said. Christ said he went to hell. He went to hell, that's where he went, he went to hell. And they had a big funeral for him downtown, you know, and they had all the Paul bearers there, you know, and they made us a 32nd degree or something, and they had a bunch of folks in there, you know, talking about what a good man he was, and the preacher was a liberal, got up with his collar on backwards, his RSB in his hand, you know, and he got up there and he said, Beloved of God. <laughs> you ever go one of them? We are gathered together in this Augusta Sunday. <laughs> To commemorate the departure of this dear beloved brother. He was a good man, and although he had his faults, there is so much bad in the best of us, and so much good in the worst of us, that it ill behooves us to judge one another. And I'm sure that a loving, kindly, heavenly Father, in his infinite, tender mercy, would never send anybody to such a terrible place as <coughs> hell. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, if they're afraid to say it, I'm not afraid to say it. Well, the guy went to hell, H-E-W-L was hell, he went to hell, that's where he went, went to hell. Went to hell, I know why people don't believe in hell. Some people don't believe in hell because their mothers are there. Some people don't believe in hell because their fathers are there. I know some Christians quit believing in hell because their children are on the way. I know some people quit believing in hell because if they believe in hell, they have to witness, they don't want to witness. You may not believe in hell, but your reason for not believing in hell has nothing to do with the New Testament. It has to do with humanism. It has to do with you worshiping people and thinking more of people than you do of God. You don't fool me for a minute. Not a minute. My little girl said to me one time, Lord, she said to me about five or six years ago, she said, Daddy, she said, is your mother still living? And I said, no, honey, she's dead. And Laura said, is she, was she saved? I said, no, she wasn't saved. And Laura said, well, is, is she in hell right now? And I said, yes, she died out Christ in hell. And Laura, about eight years old at the time, she said, well, is she burning? And I said, uh, yes, she's in hell, she's burning. And that's it. Some of you don't understand that. You know why I don't understand that? Because you're idolaters. <laughs> And you think more of your wife and your mother and your father and your children and your boss than you do God Almighty. Amen. That's your Amen. problem. And that thing is all over this country. It's just bad in the fundamentalist as any place else. Let me tell you something. That Bible says one thing and my mother says something else. My mother's wrong. Amen. That Bible says one thing and my kids say something else. My kids are wrong. My Bible says one thing, and my wife says something else, she's wrong. And I'll tell her. And she's sitting there tonight, I'll tell her, tell you in front of her. That's how that thing goes. Let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs> I was talking to you tonight how the faculty of Pillsbury and Piedmont, Northwestern and Southwestern, and Midwestern, Northeast to Southeast, and Byron and Tennessee Temple and Bob Jones and Hyland Anderson and Pacific Coast Bible College sitting here, if they said one thing and the Bible said another, I have no more respect for anyone. They weren't even that broom. If I spit on them one time, I'd drown a whole bunch. Yeah. When that book says something, you can count on it. Yeah. Bible said he was buried and in hell. And in hell, he lifted his eyes being in torment. He went to hell. He went to hell. That's where he went. Yeah. Billy Sunday said he went to hell. Billy Sunday used to preach. I mean, he'd, he'd have liberals on his platform just like Billy Graham does. But Billy wouldn't feel him the same way. I mean, Billy wouldn't, Billy wouldn't get up on the platform, you know, and then ask him to lead in prayer and brag about him. He'd get him up there, Bob Jones told me he'd get up there on the platform, he'd walk up and down in front of him like this and point his finger at him, and so I want to tell you preachers up there, if you've never been born again, you're going to hell, and you're going to burn in hell like you burn when you strike a fire, just like you take a match and strike a match, and you're going to hell. <laughs> Not a bunch of communists would sit up there and pull up their collars and... <laughs> <laughs> Go out the door and one of them say, I believe he, he, he was extremely bad taste. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Went to hell, that's where he went. Went to hell and his hell and his burning. I talked to a no heller one time down in South Alabama. That's what we call him down there, no heller either. He's a JW. And I talked to him about 20 minutes and proved it was a hell. He gave me about 50 verses to prove it wasn't. I gave him about 50 verses to prove it was. We went round and round and got nowhere. 
And after a while, I said, well, Tom, I want to ask you something. I said, I know you don't believe in hell. I know you don't, and I'm not going to convince you. But I said, if you did believe in hell, I said, I know you don't. But if you did, I said, tell me, I said, what difference would it make in your life? That old reprobate looked out across those cornfields a couple of minutes, and then he said, well, he said, I reckon if I believe in hell, he said, I reckon I'll live a lot different than what I'll do. I said, ah, that's an honest confession if you ever heard it. The fellow died and was buried, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy, and send Lazarus, and dip his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You say, how could God be a torture master and let somebody burn in hell? Well, that's easy. Our God's a consuming fire. Amen. You say, well, why would he let somebody burn forever in hell? Well, that's the part of his nature that's his wrath against sin. Take your pick. Amen. You know what happened to the three Hebrew children when they stepped in the fire furnace? Just as cool and nice as an April day. They didn't feel the heat. God is purer than sunlight, people. He's the source of all the energy in the universe. If you get in there and you're composed of whatever electrons and protons, talk to you on a college level if you want it. If whatever you get back there where he is, you've got the same protons, the neutrons and composition he has, you'll be at one with him and you won't feel nothing out of place. But you get there as an unsaved sinner, you'll feel his nature. His nature is fire. That's all there is to it. That Bible doesn't say God wants you in hell. That Bible says God wants you up there with him. That Bible says, depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for who? Who? Why, well, sure not for men. You never read about hell being prepared for men. If you go to hell, you'll be, out of, you'll be a misfit. You'll be in the wrong place. Now, this generation we're living in, they think hell's gotten air conditioned or something the last couple of years. Why, hell is still hell. When they, they, when they talk about it, God knows they talk about it in Hollywood enough. These new Bibles say Hades, Hades. That isn't the word, the word is hell. Well, the King James one that's up to date, these other Bibles are archaic. Said he went to Hades. Whoever a top kick come to barracks saying, get these footlockers line up or I'll kick the Hades out of you. <laughs> It's, it's hell, man, it's hell. You take Hollywood and they make a movie, they call it Hell's Angels, the Green Hell, the Black Board Hell, or Hell's Jungle, the Things of Hell. They ought to call it Hell with these, the word so much. And you take that thing, they, they know what the word is, went to hell. Down there in Robertsdale, Alabama, I heard something one time I'll never forget. It made a lasting impression on me. I never have forgotten. And one of those things that came up to an uneducated preacher. He was a pastor of a small church up in a place called Wahe, Alabama. And Lottie, Alabama, I mean, must have at least 500 people in it. Just a wide place in the room. And we were at this pastor's conference and a simultaneous revival meeting. And all the preachers were getting up and talking about this and that and the other. And one fellow got up there from the First Baptist Church of, uh, I think it was Robertsdale, Alabama. And he was a nice fellow, young fellow, right out of seminary and kind of green, you know. But he's, he loved the Lord. And he was sincere. A little bit full of himself, but he's sincere. And he got up and Truly, just sober the heart attack. He got up there and he said, uh, you know, I've read my Greek Testament through five times. He had to tell us that, you know. And he said, I just can't find in there about uh, denying hell. He said, I believe in hell. And he said, I preach about hell. But he said, there's something bothers me. And he's really sincere, see. And he said, the trouble thing that bothers me is every time I get preaching about hell, some of my best members get upset. So I understand why that is. He's really serious. And this old preacher from Lottie raised his hand up. And he said, well, I'll tell you the trouble there, Reverend. He said, you wouldn't want nobody talking about your home that way, would you? That's profound, man. That's profound. Listen, when you, you hear a preacher air condition hell because he's about to move in. You folks live out here. You got Robert Schuler up the road up there in that blooming Chinese restaurant or whatever he's got built up there. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you heard him preach a good message on hell? Ain't that a strange thing? Yeah. You know, back in the old days in this country, I say old days in this country, even 90 years ago, or maybe 100 years ago, a sinner when he got on a condition could find no rest. 
in going to a Baptist church, and the Baptist would tell him, you're going to hell, you've got to be born again. And that fellow would get horrified, run out of that Baptist church, and run to an Episcopal church, and back in those days, the Episcopal churches preach you need to be saved, and you go to hell. And the fellow around the Episcopal little Presbyterian church, they'd tell him this four days go to hell if he didn't look out. And that guy would just run up and down, he wouldn't have a place to go. But listen, listen. Now it's so fixed, any time a sinner gets under conviction, he can go three blocks and lose his conviction and get to the You know who's going to give Brother Lee the hardest time in this town? The preachers. You know what they're going to do? They're going to talk nice and sweet and soft soap you and give you something you like so you'll think he's a mean old fella. That's what they're going to do. That's why it's so hard to do anything these days. You get a guy in a condition, he's run down, some preacher slap him on the back. You're all right, son. You're all right. No, you're not. You're going to hell. You're going to go to hell. You're going to burn. I may be talking to someone in this building tonight that's going to go to hell. And he said, about that, he said, no. He said, there's a great gulf betwixt you and us. They which would come to us cannot come. Neither can they pass by that would come from, you, from us to you. And he said, I pray to their forefather Abraham. I would send in my father's house, for I have five brothers. Think of that. Think of a family of six boys in an autumn law. I've got five brothers. And let him testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now, don't you know they had an old man? There was some old man up there had six boys, and all of them headed for hell. Can't you just see him? Boy, I bet I've talked to him before. I bet I've talked to him many a time. I bet that old man was a cutter. I bet he's a pistol ball, man. I can see that fellow sitting around with a cigar. Well, preacher, <clears throat> well, I look at it. Well, I thought I'd get old enough to choose for himself, you know. I don't believe in making kids go to church, you know. I was made to go when I was a boy. And I said, when they get on with their lives themselves, they say, I'm a crazy fool. Six boys, one in hell, and five on the way. And he said, send Lazarus. And he said, no. Well, then send him back to my brothers. Let him testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Give man enlightening. You know what that says? That says the people in hell don't want you there. I'll tell you some folks don't want you in hell. I don't want you in hell. I don't get any, I don't get any sadistic pleasure talking about folks going to hell. My mother, enough, unless a miracle happened to her before she died, she's there. I witnessed my mother and daddy for eight years. They were high church Episcopal people. My father was a vestryman. My mother's raised over in Pasadena, California. She had a Chinese cook and a Japanese gardener raising the boarding school. She could walk, work any crossword puzzle in this country in 30 minutes. My class folk, boy. I don't impress you that way. It's because I'm a reactionary. I was raising it. I know that bunch. You always hope, you know, when they were dying and got in a coma, you know, maybe the Lord did something. Maybe the word of God got through to them. I don't say it can't happen. Now, those things happen sometimes. But it's pretty rough hope if that's all I hope you got to hang on to. Ain't much. Father died. MIT, Boston, master's degree, IQ 160. I know that cloud. I went to hell in that church and off on for 15 years and nobody told me how to get saved. And I've resented it ever since. I've been mad about it ever since. And I'm going to stay mad about it. Amen. All these rich, smooth, cultured folk, I know them. I know them. Some of the meanest devils in the face of this earth. You hope they get saved. You think I get any pleasure standing here talking about these things? I'll face my mother someday. I'll see her. Now these fellas talk before Jacques has a peace call song my mother taught me. When I hear that thing, I always kind of get a wry smile on my face. I think myself, boy, if I sang you the first song I heard my mother ever sing, curl her hair in the back of your head. And that was back in 1923. They moved up fast, man. I couldn't sing in the first song I ever heard her sing. I remember the word in it. She died of chronic alcoholic. I sat there, the white throne jumping. I've become my mother. I've become my father. Smoking. Brimstone. Filthy rags. The prop you curse an everlasting fire. The bed that within. I'm not told you how to get saved. I witnessed to you. I wrote you letters. I sent you cracks. I plead down your debt. You think I get any particular enjoyment by talking about it? I don't get nothing out of it. Let me tell you, if there's any hell, if there's any hell, I'm getting out of the ministry tonight. 
there's any point in me preaching. These are where I make a living in this, man. Right. Go back and join the army, boy. It's all a day and the work ain't hard. <laughs> never hurry, never worry, never volunteer. Just stay away from all the room. Keep your mouth shut. Let's move in the saloon. It's lying down. Pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. General orders. <laughs> going to hell. You're going to hell. I don't care what you think of this message, just don't go to hell. Yeah. You folks that are gray headed and white headed, don't go to hell. You never forgive me, you never forgive yourself. I don't want you to go to hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell. Christ doesn't want you to go to hell. The Christians don't want you to go to hell. The Holy Spirit doesn't want you to go to hell. The people in hell don't want you to go there. Why would you die in your sins? Why would you go? You know why you're with? You're smart. You know more than I know. You're smarty. You know something I don't. You're going to make it. See? I'm not going to convince you. Reason isn't going to convince you. He's anybody else. Somebody's going to hold on. If you had 50 evangelists in here, you'd still go to hell. And God wouldn't want you to. And Christ died to keep you from going to hell. You're a fool to go. He said, well, send a dead man back to him and they'll believe. You know what, you know what Abraham told him? He said, listen. He said, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, though a dead man preached them, spoke to them. But one note, come back from the dead. Now, do you know how I know that's right? Because Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, and some of you still don't believe. Lazarus came up from the dead, and they didn't believe. And that isn't the worst of it. And that isn't the most of it. You know what the most of it is? The most of it is, about 34 years ago, God Almighty reached down from heaven into the streets of Pensacola, Florida, in a flop house, 10 cents a bed in the can to spit in, and took an old washed out drunken instrument and raised him from the dead and put new life in him and said, go tell him. I've been telling you. I've been telling you. Don't go to hell. Don't take a chance. If you don't know you're saved, you come down here tonight and make sure it's taken care of. You're so thin skinned, you don't want to neither for a bunch of people that get embarrassed that way. Go back in the prayer room, have somebody go back with you back in the prayer room, you get a settle back there. But just whatever you do, don't go to hell. Well, you want to think about me? Okay, you want to think I'm a fanatic? Help yourself. It's a free country. I could care less. Well, if you want to think about me, you're at liberty to do it. But don't go to hell. You won't go to hell and come back. Audie Murphy made a movie called Set the Hell and Back. He never got the hell and back. And if he's in hell right now, he ain't coming back either. That's right. All right, Father, that's the message tonight. I pray the Holy Spirit of God to speak something light about these matters. We know you've done what was necessary to keep us out of this place. And we know the only reason you have this place is because you're holy and you can't tolerate sin. You're not going to tolerate sin. You're going to put sin in a white-hot furnace where it'll, there won't be a germ left and the infection won't spread any further. It'll be sterilized forever. And Lord, how God, how thankful we are we don't have to feel that part of your nature. And how thankful we are that we know about the other side of your nature, your love and your mercy and your grace and your kindness. And we pray that some sinner here tonight might take advantage of this and receive your son as a savior. I let some aim, head bowed, and eyes closed in prayer while the pianist plays. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing an invitation hymn. I'm going to turn the invitation over to your pastor as the Lord leads him. Before we stand and sing, I want to have you bow your head back there and think for a while and ask yourself this question. Am I saved? Saved. Buddha doesn't save anybody. You never saw a sign in your life that said Confucius saves or Muhammad saves because they don't. Jesus saves people. He's a savior. Do you know when he saved you? Do you know where he saved you? Do you know what he saved you from? Now if you don't know the answer to those questions, get them settled tonight. You go out that door tonight, if the whole Pacific Coast shelf drops off, or the atom bombs come, or the thermonuclear starts, or the bank drops out, you starve to death, you know one thing for sure, you're going to be up there someday with Jesus and things are going to be right. You make sure of that here. Father, bless the invitation. Speak to hearts of men and women, boys and girls. We pray that many tonight that might trust Christ the Savior and bring them to open confession. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand and sing this song, you know.